everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I'm going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, we are definitely going to be covering an animal uh, of the furry variety because we are covering the oh so wonderful ferret. So this is a very, very special listener episode dedicated to Cat and her pet, Tacky the Ferret. Um, so this entire episode wouldn't be possible without you guys. So thank you so much for writing in. If you want to have your um, animal on the podcast, you you have a couple of options here now that the podcast has grown a little bit. You can send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com, or you could also send me a message on Instagram at relaxwithanimalfacts. So uh, those are the two options that we have available as of right now, Um, but I have found that so many of you have been able to reach out and recommend things, and I'm so very happy that there's so many of you out there that are passionate uh, about animals and want to learn more. And that is really, you know, why I love doing this podcast. So for those of you that are first time listeners, I am by no means an animal expert, an animal biologist. I am none of those titles. I am simply a man who really loves animals, enjoys learning, and wants to share that very special experience with each and every one of you listening. So before we get into the show, I'm just going to talk about how you can support the show if you've been listening for a while or if you just want to support the show however you can. Um, So the main ways of supporting the show are if you're listening on Spotify or anywhere like that, Clicking follow is a huge thing. It can really help get this podcast out to some other people who also want to relax with animal facts. Um, Or if you have a rating system of some kind, maybe on Apple Podcasts, I've been seeing that um, many of you have been giving the podcast five stars, which I oh so appreciate. Thank you so much for all of you who are doing that. Alternatively, you can go to patreon.com slash relax with animal facts if you're interested in supporting the show any further. So for those of you that are ready to relax and unwind, go ahead and take a deep breath, relax your muscles, notice where you're tense, and just relax as you're taken into this immersive experience with me into the forests and grasslands where we're going to be finding these lovely little furry guys here known as ferrets. I got my facts from fda.gov, mentalfloss.com, and a new resource which I have never used before, which is cuteness.com. So I have used three resources for the ferret. Um, which is awesome. We have a few facts to get through. I'm going to take my time because I know that many of you want to just be able to soak up some of this information. So I'm going to try my best to pace myself as I want to um, because sometimes I get super excited about the animals that we're learning about on the show and I can sort of start to speed up. So I'm really really working on that. So bear with me if I start to speed up a little bit. I'll catch myself and make sure that I'm going at a speed at which I like and more, much more importantly, all of you enjoy. So the ferrets belong to the weasel family. Here we go with another scientific nomenclature that is very oftentimes used to throw Steph Wolf off specifically. Mustelidae. That is what is known as the weasel family, Uh, and that includes animals such as polecats, stoats, and ermines, many animals that I personally have never even heard of, Um, but these are all members of the weasel family. Now, domesticated ferrets most likely descend from the European polecat, okay? And now, talking about the European polecat, 
why don't we talk about the European ferret? So there are two different kinds of main ferrets that we're going to cover in the show, and that is the European ferret and the black-footed ferret. Now, the European ferret is found throughout Europe, also uh, Asia, and even northern Africa. So they have a fairly large range, and they will make use of local things such as barns or little tunnels that they find in order to live their daily life. Now, in North America, the most common ferret that we come across is going to be the black-footed ferret. So it is known throughout North America, unless um, unless you, I suppose, have imported a European ferret as a pet, it is more likely you're going to come into the black-footed fer- uh, ferret if you live sort of in the Western society here. Now, ferrets live in a variety of habitats, which include plains, forests, even mountainous regions, deserts, tundra, and grasslands. But here it is written that the main ones that you will find them in are grasslands and forests in the wild. I suppose the most, the most common habitats that they, um, that they like to be in. Now, I know people personally who have ferrets as pets, and they were domesticated about 2,500 years ago. So about 2,500 years. So that is a decent, uh, a decently long time. And historically, the ferrets were used to hunt rabbits and other rodents that could have been causing, say, problems for agriculture or for different sorts of things. So the ferrets were domesticated to, uh, to be used mainly for their amazing hunting capabilities. If you haven't seen a ferret before, um, they are v- very lean. So they um, these lean bodies that they have, and also their very curious nature, makes them um, absolutely um, uh, naturals at getting down holes to chase rodents and rabbits out of burrows that could be causing some people um, problems or trouble. And this is the origin of the expression that possibly some of you have heard before, which is ferret out. So this is why they were domesticated such a long time ago. They are very keen hunters and hunters that have an easy time maneuvering through, I suppose you can say, a difficult terrain in a way, through tight spaces such as burrows, maybe different kinds of holes and tunnels, so they're able to really um, catch rodents and things like that. So from 1860 to the start of World War II, they were widely used in the American West to protect grain stores from rodents. So here we see them being used as a sort of, um, I suppose you can say, a natural uh, rodent hunter in a way. And they gained popularity mainly as pets in the 1980s and the 1990s. And I suppose that that continued to today because they are still uh, being used as, as pets today. And people really, really love having these guys as pets just because they're very cute. They have a very curious nature and makes them great pets. Now, a ferret's normal heart rate is very, very high. It is about 200 to 250 beats per minute. Now, this is pretty common, I would say, among um, many smaller animals. So you see this in, for example, dogs, right? Dogs have a much higher higher, uh, heart rate than we human beings do, but ferrets are really taking the cake on that by being uh, having heart rates of of 200 to 250. So that is very, very high. Now, for comparison's sake, my heart rate is probably around 70 beats per minute. So the ferret has me beat by almost three times my heart rate. Although for me, as a uh, as a young male, it would not be good for me to have 200 
to 250 beats per minute. By no means is more better. It all is dependent on species. It's dependent on physiology, anatomy. Um, in their case, it could be the size of their heart, um, how their system really works, their cardiovascular system. So by no means is more heart rate better. It's just that more heart rate or less heart rate is going to be um, suitable for your uh, for the species cardiovascular system to work optimally. Now, the average lifespan, if you want a domestic ferret, is about eight years or so. So for those of you that are interested in having, um, in having ferrets, eight years is the average lifespan that they have. Now, ferrets are most active at dawn and dusk. So they will hunt, I suppose, in the wild at these times, or uh, alternatively, if you do have them as pets, they may be more active around these times. Now, an intact female ferret is known as a jill. A spade female is a sprite, which is sort of an interesting term that they used. An intact male is a hob, and a neutered male is a gib. And baby ferrets that are that uh, they qualify as baby ferrets when they are less than one year old, they are called kits. So we've seen kits used before in some earlier episodes. Um, you suppose can try to remember what animals have we covered that their babies are called kits. I suppose it's almost like a little quiz for me and you. Now, a group of ferrets is a is is called something which I absolutely love, which is a business. So these little ferrets sure are professional because when they all get together for I suppose a, a ferret meeting, a professional ferret meeting, it is a business. So you can say a business of ferrets, which is personally my favorite fact so far. I love that. Now, all kits, if we remember kits is just the name for baby ferrets, they're born with a very white fur, and they will get their um, adult color at approximately three weeks of age. So they mature rather quickly which would make sense given their eight-year lifespan. Now, ferrets can get heartworms from the bite of, say, an infected mosquito. Ferrets are very similar to dogs in that way that they are susceptible to certain things such as heartworm infections, things like that, but their symptoms aren't going to be more similar to that seen in cats. So, because they're domestic animals, of course, there is going to be certain things that you have to um, look out for. In my case, I have a little dog named Molly who absolutely loves the outdoors. But say we go to more uh, rural outdoor places, maybe places that are more, I guess you could say, in the wild, then um, things, you know, you risk things such as fleas or or ticks, so sometimes you have to take certain precautions to make sure that um, that your animal doesn't get these sorts of things, because it can be, you know, no one wants a tick, no one wants a flea. Um, I don't know if they would be a very good um, candidate for the show, um, but regardless, ferrets, just like dogs, um, you know, uh, have these sorts of troubles sometimes, so... Um, if you do plan on getting a ferret as a pet, just to be aware of, of, of what, um, you know, is to come and what you can do for these little guys to live their uh, fullest lives. Now, in the wild, ferrets and stoats perform a kind of hypnotic dance that will, that they're doing in order to send their prey into a kind of trance. Now, domestic ferrets will also perform this dance, but instead of using it for regular hunting purposes, they will use it for play. 
Um, if you see, uh, if you have a domestic ferret and they're sort of, you know, uh, dancing around, this is a playful thing. But in the wild, they use it as a mechanism for hunting, which I think is really, really cool. I can't think of any other animal that uses dance in order to catch prey. So the ferrets definitely have something going on here. They like to dance, they like to have fun, but they can also be professional. And when they get together, they can be uh, a business, which I still really, really enjoy. That's not going to get old for me. So um, this dance will look as, as if they are arching their backs, they will puff their tails up, and they will move side to side in this little, uh, in, in this kind of way. And this is usually a sign that the ferret is happy and having fun if they're in the domestic household. If they're in the wild and they're dancing, they are most likely not doing it just to have fun. They are probably doing it to try to send their prey into this kind of hypnotic trance to make it easier for them to hunt. So um, I thought that was really, really cool. Black-footed ferrets, or American polecats, they live in central North America, and they will feast on prairie dogs almost exclusively. And scientists discovered that in South Dakota, 91% of the black-footed uh, ferret's diet consisted of prairie dogs. So 91%. And here we see why it's so important for nature to have a balance. Because, for example, if something happened to the population of prairie dogs, that would not only affect the prey of prairie dogs, but it would affect greatly the population of um, ferrets, of wild black-footed fer ferrets in America. Now, this is just a something that we can draw from nature in terms of nature always has a way of balancing itself. And if that balance is thrown aside for whatever reason, could be habitat loss, could be other, even not even man-made things, maybe something natural happens. Um, and um, for example, the prairie dog population suffers. If that happens, black-footed ferrets are going to be in a little bit of trouble because now their primary diet, 91%, is going to be affected. So that is just something I um, always sort of take into account and appreciate is the ability of nature to strike a balance and these kinds of things that it does to compensate for certain, say, species decline or species increase. I just think it is super, super um, cool. Now, because they are known for their love of burrowing, ferrets can use their skill by running through pipes, and this can be used for a bunch of commercial or even or certain professional uses. Uh, for example, you can imagine sometimes wires can't be pushed through tubes or tunnels with rods. Ferrets can be used in order to to finish the job, so these tiny uh, these tiny critters can step in and they can pull wire through underground tunnels and even helped lay wire for London's Party in the Park concert in 1999. So I think that is just so amazing that not only do they love to uh, to to play in things at home and also are adept hunters in the wild, they can be used for commercial or professional purposes to, you know, thread wires through long tunnels or holes. In London, ferret racing is actually a very popular sport that involves competing ferrets that will race through drain pipes. Now, don't worry, apparently the animals thoroughly enjoy the games. They're very playful, they're curious, so they enjoy it. Um, and they also enjoy the company of their fellow ferrets, or I, I can say their fellow competitors. Um, so a small section of the pipe is removed, 
and replaced with some chicken wire so viewers can know when the pets are about halfway through. So here we see just how many things these amazing little guys can do from professional to commercial um, purposes or for ferret racing or for those that love these uh, their curious personality. They can have them as pets. Um, they make good pets for a lot of people. Of course, the, you know, some people prefer dogs, some prefer cats, but some can prefer ferrets and other more maybe uncommon um, pets. They have a lot of love to give and they have a lot of need to want to explore because they truly are one of the world's most curious animals. Now, let's move on to the final fact of the episode, which is the name, right? The name ferret. Where does it come from? Well, the name ferret is derived from the Latin word ferritus, which means little thief. And this name is likely um, referring to the common ferret habit of uh, sort of storing away little small uh, items that they find or that they like, I suppose. So I think that that is so cute that they have the little thief name. I would, I would also imagine that uh, other animals such as a raccoon, for example, would have this kind of little, um, you know, little thief connotation just because they do truly look like little burglars. But raccoons are for another time. We're finishing up with the ferret. So I learned a lot about these guys and I truly understand why many people decide to have them as pets. Um, they provide a lot and they're very, very um, cute. So now, after learning as much as I did with each and every one of you listening, I definitely understand why people love having ferrets as pets domestically. I think that they are really curious, really playful. They have a lot to offer a household, and it seems like they would be um, an awesome addition to many um, to many households out there. Now, again, this episode was dedicated to Tacky the Ferret and Cat, so thank you so much for writing in. This podcast wouldn't it be possible for each and every one of you. Now, I am always open to more suggestions and more ideas for the podcast. If you want to have your animal on the podcast, you can write in to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com or follow the Instagram relaxwithanimalfacts and send me a message. I respond to each and every one of you. I always get so excited and so giddy whenever I see a message from one of you listeners out there. It makes me uh, so excited and so happy. And lastly, at the end of my show, I am always going to be thanking those of you that are subscribed through Patreon. So Kat, thank you for being a patron of the show. It is very, very appreciated. It helps the show go forward and helps keep it running. So um, again, for those of you that want to support the show in that way, you can visit relaxwithanimalfacts.com and go to Patreon. So thank you so much for listening. I hope to see you on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.